from WBAL-TV, WBAL-Radio, and Maryland Public Television. This is a Commitment 2024 special. Baltimore City Mayoral Debate. On stage at the Murphy Fine Arts Center at Morgan State University, here's your moderator, Jason Newton. Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. We will hear from the top Democratic candidates for mayor here in Baltimore City on the campus of Morgan State University inside of the Murphy Fine Arts Center. I will be your moderator tonight for a, a debate that's brought to you by WBAL-TV, WBAL News Radio, along with Maryland Public Television. Asking the questions tonight, familiar faces and voices, starting with former lead investigative reporter Jay Miller, turned talk show host. Also over at WBAL Radio is Clarence Mitchell IV, C4, and Jeff Salkin is joining us from Maryland Public Television. Tonight you will hear opening statements from each candidate. Now this order was selected randomly. That order will be through Vignaraja, Sheila Dixon, Mayor Brandon Scott, and Bob Wallace. We'll begin now with those opening statements. Mr. Vignaraja, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. My name is Thiru Vignaraja. When I was three years old, my parents, with $200 in their pockets and two infants in their arms, crossed an ocean in search of a better life. Baltimore gave them a chance. It was here they found a home for their family and jobs as teachers. My mom at Poly and right here at Morgan State, my dad at Edmondson, and then Douglas at Southern, and then Western. When he retired, he was the oldest teacher teaching in the state of Maryland. He was 80 years old. He doesn't like me sharing that with people, but that's the tradition in which I was raised. It was a tradition of grit and hard work, of faith and public service, and I've tried my best to live up to that legacy. I went to local public schools from Edmondson Heights Elementary and Woodlawn High to Yale College and Harvard Law School. I served as president of the Harvard Law Review, clerked on the U.S. Supreme Court for Justice Breyer, and came home to my hometown to serve as a federal and city prosecutor and as deputy attorney general for the state of Maryland. I'm running for mayor because there is no city in America that has more of a distance between where we are and where we could be. The westernmost deep water port on the eastern seaboard, an international airport, two sports franchises in perpetual brink of greatness, local flagship law schools, the best hospitals in the world, and a location between the political and financial capitals of the world. We have everything that anyone could ever ask for is except leadership. That's what this city needs, and that's what I'm going to deliver. Sir, thank you. Ms. Dixon. I'm a mother, soon-to-be grandmother, a former teacher, and a public servant. As many of you know, in the course of my time in office, I made a mistake. I undermined the trust that you placed in me and interrupted the work that we did to reduce crime, to clean up the city, to educate our young people. The truth is, I was content sp spending my time working in the community. But I'm standing here today running for mayor of Baltimore because people who stopped me on the street, people who have encouraged me to run, people who have done everything in their power to see that I had the ability to run this city. I'm running because 10 years from now, we should not be going around the cycle dealing with the violent crime that we're facing, being the number one dirtiest city in America and the most unhealthiest city in America. You need someone who is an adult, who can manage, who can lead this city and direct and work cohesively with our partners in this great city. We have all the key ingredients to be successful, but we are disconnected because we don't communicate across the city to address the issues that we impact. So because of this moment, the leadership that is needed is why I stepped up to be running for mayor. And I need your support, and I need your help in helping us to change the directory of Baltimore City. Thank you. Ms. Dixon, thank you. Mayor Scott. Thank you. Uh, Baltimore. When I was sworn into office four years ago, after a campaign where I promised to move us away from the decades of disinvestment in our neighborhoods and people, away from the leadership, corruption, and scandals, we were at the height of a global pandemic. People were dying by the hundreds, and we didn't know what the next month was going to look like, let alone the next four years. 
homicides in Baltimore have been stuck above 300 every single year following the, pan the uh, Freddie Gate unrest. Unemployment in Baltimore was at nearly 9%, and we have been stuck at 16,000 vacant properties for 20 years. But even amidst that crisis, I got to work, leading us through the pandemic, and Baltimore fared best, better than most major cities. Preventing gun violence was our top priority, which is why I created the first ever comprehensive violence prevention plan in Baltimore's history, and it's working. We had a historic reduction of 20% in homicides last year, and we're expanding that this year with 32% reduction even further. Last year, Baltimore had its lowest unemployment ever in the city, and we hit our lowest vacant houses in two decades. We did all of this while leading the right way, without corruption, without scandal, opening rec centers and new schools, not closing them. Now is not the time for Baltimore to go back to the failed policies of the past, but to double down on what's working to make Baltimore move forward. Mr. Mayor, thank you. Bob Wallace. Thank you. Dr. Wilson, faculty, staff, and students at this great institution, you are truly a national treasure, and we're grateful that you're hosting us today. We are also delighted that you are a part of the Baltimore City fabric. But our city is in trouble. Most cities and societies have classes. You have the upper class, you have the middle class, you have the working class, but what's emerging in Baltimore is what I refer to as the irrelevant class. These are men and women who, through no fault of their own, because of lack of skills, education, and economic opportunity, have not been able to create, to have the economic benefit to allow them to contribute. And so they struggle. They struggle economically. You may wonder, why does that matter to me? Because every discussion we're going to have this afternoon either directly or indirectly ties to that particular group's plight. And so we have to address that as a city to be great. And you're wondering, what will Mayor Wallace do? Well, Mayor Wallace, and I'm so glad you asked that question, Mayor Wallace is going to remodel and remake three areas of government, how government delivers services to the people, how it builds an education system that is world class, and how we build an economy that benefits the neighborhoods and the people in those neighborhoods, and not just the people who work in the shiny buildings around the the harbor. That's my plan. I look forward to having this conversation. Mr. Wallace, thank you. Our first question tonight will come from C4. Good evening, candidates. Look, Mayor Scott just said it. We experienced eight straight years of 300 homicides and 700 non-fatal shootings following the death of Freddie Gray. We've seen significant declines in the last two years, and this one as well, downward. But we see juvenile crime as the issue now. We had 30 people shot at Brooklyn homes, half of them juveniles last July. An arrest just took down 20 juveniles between the age of 12 and 17. What will you do as mayor to try to deal with the, just the part that we need to really deal with at this point, juvenile crime? Mr. Vigranajo, one minute. Certainly. I believe so. Um, look, there's no challenge more defining than juvenile crime. In the walls of Frederick Douglass High School, it is written, it is easier to raise strong children than to repair broken men. Part of the solution is that our schools are failing. Our chronic absenteeism rate has gone up over the last few years from 30% to over 54%. That is something that we have to change. We have to get our kids back in our schools. But we also have to teach these young offenders that there are consequences for their conduct. I spent my career as a prosecutor, as a federal and city prosecutor, and when we had murders below 200 in 2011, it was because there were consequences for violent crimes. Today, carjackers, robbers, auto thefts, committed by children, committed by youthful offenders, are being treated like you're stealing bubble gum from the cafeteria. These are crimes, and we're condemning these young men and young women to a life of crime because we're not teaching them that there have to be consequences for that conduct. We're going to do very specific things, including a presumption of detention for violent crimes for 30 to 60 days so we can evaluate what these kids need and, and sir, get them back on track. And, sir, that's your time. And pardon me, Ms. Dixon, you were supposed to go first on that one. I apologize. Oh. You, you may go next. We talk about statistics. Crime is down. I'm a prime example where crime went down 20 years below, and we were able to deal with juvenile crime, quality of life crime. Maybe some young people are not currently squeegeeing, but they're stealing cars versus squeegeeing in some cases. 
We need to work with juvenile justice, juvenile services. We need to work with the state's attorney's office and all of our public safety. But we have to go even deeper than that. We have to go back in what's happening in the, house, in the home as well in the school. Any young person that's probably out there committing a crime is probably truant from school. We've got to take a holistic approach, and this is where community schools come in for me, where we're working with the families and those children and juvenile services to make sure that we are providing them with the support that they need in order to address those issues. The bottom line is that we can talk about statistics, but if we don't get to the root of what's happening in our community, we're going to be losing more residents to Baltimore County and other surrounding counties. Uh, thank you, and thank you for the question, C4. We have to continue to build. Uh, we know uh, that when I presented this uh, comprehensive plan, it's the first time it had been done in Baltimore's history in 2021. We have to continue to grow that. We know that the state, our partners at the state, DJS, uh, that my opponent just mentioned, is modeling uh, one of their programs that is dealing with uh, chronic youth offenders after my group violence reduction strategy. We're going to support them in the Thrive program. I am the mayor that has invested more in the public education of our Baltimore City public school students than anyone in history. No one can argue with that. We have to continue to do that. My police officers will continue to make the arrest of anybody that is committing crime. I don't care how old you are. But what we have to do is continue to work with our partners at the state to modernize their systems, like we did with uh, home monitoring, that we no longer will allow people, young people included, to be outside of where they're supposed to be for 48 hours before action is taken. That is leadership that I led because of the incidents that we've had in the city and the families that I have to talk to who are suffering as a result of it. Thank you, sir. Mr. Wallace. I will use the same approach that my daddy used in, in Cherry Hill raising five boys, and that is a belt and a carrot. Daddy made it very clear. If you broke the rules, there were going to be consequences. It doesn't matter how old the person is. If they're old enough to commit the crime, they're old enough to do the time. Now, the idea is to provide them a foundation in which they make, they make better choices. But let's be clear, not only is the child to be held accountable, but their parents. Their parents also need to be held accountable because we cannot have a city that allows this, this, this lawlessness to continue and to hurt our citizens. It all ties into education. It all ties into the economy of young people having jobs and work that they can do. But let's be clear, being poor and being in poverty does not give you the right to hurt somebody or take someone's life. That can never be an excuse, nor will it be an excuse under Mayor Wallace. Wallace. Jay Miller. Thanks, Jason. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Voters in November will decide whether to allow residential development at Harbor Place, part of developer David Bramble's plan for redevelopment. Do you support residential development at Harbor Place? And as mayor, will you commit city dollars for promenade improvements and street redesign as envisioned by the developer? I believe we're starting with Ms. Dixon. We'll get back on track here. I respect that Mr. Bramble has purchased the building. The city owns most of that property. My challenge is that there needs to be a balance. I do not want to see 900 apartments. I want to see a balance that we can attract residents as well as visitors to Baltimore. I also know that we have to look at what's happening two blocks away from the harbor where it's died and dead on Calvert Street, Baltimore Street. So there's a balance. We also have to figure out where's the money, the infrastructure money is going to come from. Are we going to take all of our infrastructure money and put in that project and, and neglect streets that are outside of the city that we need to address? And so for me, it's a balance. And I keep telling the voters they have to make the choice on Election Day um, on, in November. But last but not least, if we don't involve and engage the community to be a part of that process and do side deals as this mayor has done, then we're not going to get what the community wants. Mayor Scott. First, uh, my opponent is just blatantly lying. This wasn't a side deal. This happened through receivership in the court. 
uh, the court of law here in Baltimore City. We know that Harper Place had been deteriorating on, it, er, deteriorating on itself for decades. Every mayor before me had the opportunity to push it into receivership. They did nothing, including my opponent. I, we went through this process to make sure that we got it in the hands of a Baltimorean who understood the history of the Inner Harbor, including the history that didn't allow folks like myself to feel comfortable there. There's no secret that I support of the plan at hand. Uh, to your question, Jane, the promenade has to be fixed regardless because climate change is real and we have to invest city dollars into doing that because it's our responsibility. We know that downtown is our fastest growing residential neighborhood and we cannot have our face to the world sit there deteriorating on itself and have it be a place where you cannot walk. The voters will vote for this. We know they will because they understand we have to evolve our city the way we continue to do through our downtown rise program. Thank you. Yes, Scott, thank you. Mr. Wallace. I am a businessman. I own an IT firm and an energy firm. I understand the issues of business. I met with Mr. Bramble because I wanted to understand, tell me a little more about this project, right? I still have a concern about the project, threefold. Number one is I was against using public money to, to, to lift it up, and so that was a concern. Secondly, was the process that, that seemed to be used to get to some point where we could make a decision. I didn't like that idea. And then the use of the property for, for residential assets, wasn't comfortable with that too. But I did make the effort to meet with Mr. Bramble and to understand better his project and how it will benefit the people. What we cannot do in this city is keep investing citizen dollars in projects that don't benefit neighborhoods, that don't create jobs for the people of the city. For too long, we have, we have invested in these shiny buildings, but the people in the neighborhoods have not benefited. That has to stop. And so for that reason, I would say no, I would not support the project. Thank you, sir. Mr. Vigneraja. Jane, we're going to stop right now talking in circles. Uh, this is a terrible proposal that was done in a backroom deal in order to maximize the profits of a developer who happened to donate tens of thousands of dollars to my opponents. The reality is that no one wants to see the revival of Harbor Place more than me. We all grew up going there with our parents, bringing our relatives to town and taking there to see the beauty of this gemstone of our city. The notion that we would tear down these historic buildings and replace them with 900 luxury apartments, it is shameful. And I am the only uh, candidate that has pledged within the first 60 days to, by executive order, block the construction of luxury apartments in our public parks. We wouldn't do it in Druid Hill Park, New York City wouldn't do it in Central Park, and we sure are not going to do it in the Inner Harbor Park. This is a special, sacred place that is all of ours. It is not something that you mortgage off for some campaign donations and turn into luxury condos because you can't imagine something more. Mr. Vignaraja, thank you. <laughs> Typically, we would give a rebuttal when someone is uh, called out by name, so we're going to keep moving, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Okay. Salkin. Staying on the topic of, of shiny buildings for a moment, Baltimore has long done a lot of uh, tax incentive deals for developers. I'll ask you each to give me an example of a deal that you think was, was successful, benefited the city, or an example of a deal that you think was a waste of money. Yeah, I think that there, there's a, a little bit of both. When you look at uh, what has happened at Harbor Point, uh, one that I voted for as a, as a city council person, we know that that benefited the city of Baltimore, even portions of Mondawmin. But what we do know is historically they have never went into the neighborhoods, which is why as a part of my $3 billion vacant strategy that we rolled out with Build and GBC uh, last year, we are going to this summer put uh, TIF legislation in the hands of the city council so that we can eliminate vacant housing in Baltimore City once and for all, taking TIFs directly into the neighborhoods that have been disinvested in in Baltimore for generations. That is what we should be doing, not just downtown, not just Harbor East, not just things that touch the water. And we know it's such a good plan, plan that one of my opponents is taking it and saying that they agree and they want to put TIFs in neighborhoods for vacant houses as well. We know that we have a plan that works. It's extremely strong. It's just about the investment and da uptown deserve the same treatment as downtown. Mr. Mayor, thank you. Bob Wallace. I would say zero. I would say zero projects have benefited the people. Now, it depends upon what you, how you define benefit. So if you're saying benefit to developers, if you're saying benefit to investors, if you're saying a benefit to people who live in the county but who come to the city to work and then go back to the county, great benefit. But you ask someone in East Baltimore 
or West Baltimore or Cherry Hill or Mount Winans. Ask them if they've seen some benefit, and the answer is no. It's because we have not had the courage to say no to developers for projects that do not benefit the people. Mayor Wallace's plan is very simple. I will use all the dollars I can as mayor to, take, to make that investment in the neighborhoods of, for, of, of this city, to create the jobs, to attract the industries that will rebuild these, these neighborhoods. We will never be a great city until we figure out how do we economically develop our neighborhoods and create these jobs. So I say zero, sir, zero. There's been zero benefit to the people of Baltimore. Thank you, sir. Mr. Vic Naraja now. Bob is right. There aren't examples of where big public subsidies to big developers has helped anyone except for the big developers. We have the highest property taxes in the state of Maryland, twice as high as every neighboring jurisdiction. I've pledged to cut them in half over the course of 10 years. One reason is because it is, makes no sense to ask people to pay twice as much in Baltimore City for some of the worst schools in the region and the highest crime in the nation. But the other reason is because we give tax breaks to certain people. We give them to our donors and our developers. The city politicians that are on this stage have pioneered giving TIFs to their former donors to make these waterfront projects even more profitable than they already are. But when was the last time we did a public subsidy for Edmondson Village or Park Heights or Cherry Hill? The reality is that the folks that need it most are not getting the public subsidies, and the folks that need it the least, the ones that donate the most, are the ones that have always gotten it. And every city politician on this stage is guilty of that. That's your time, sir. Ms. Dixon. Obviously, my colleagues don't live in the city and really don't understand how TIFs work. I can give you example of example of a positive TIFs. Emerson Village, the Uplands, now it's finally in its third stage, was a TIF. EBDI, East Baltimore Development, the people in that community were suffering with vacant properties. Now it's flourishing and people are starting to invest in that area. The Canton and, and Brewers East are areas that have, have expanded or benefited from TIFs. So there are a lot of projects that have benefited. What hurts my heart is Mondawmin. That was a pilot and a TIF and to lose targets because of the theft and to lose all the other amenities in that area hurts my heart because we put a lot of emphasis into experience what happened this weekend to the seven-year-old girl at Mondawmin Mall. But that was a tip and a pilot that failed because of no one who understood management, no one who was reaching out to those businesses to really talk with them and assist that's your time, them with public safety. Ms. Dixon, that's your time. I do have a question for the audience. We put out a call to the Morgan campus. Anyone in their community may have a question for the candidates. Mac is an employee here, sir. Your question. Yes, my question for the candidate is, um, first and foremost, welcome to the National Treasury. We appreciate you coming Thank out you. today. Thank you. Thank you. Question is, what is your background with organized labor and how you perceive them in your administration? Yes, sir. Mr. Wallace. Yes, sir, absolutely. That's a great question, sir. First of all, in my administration, there will be a special cabinet position for organized labor. And for me, it's personal because my father worked for many, many years at Bethlehem Steel, and he was part of the union there. My mother was a, school a janitor and a school teacher, and she was part of the Baltimore Teachers Union. Unions have been one of the best vehicles to get people from, from, from poverty to the middle class, and we'd be a fool not to continue that process. Now, what we have to do, sir, we gotta get smarter about how we, how we do it and how we, how we implement it, but certainly unions have always played a critical role in, in, in creating and building and strengthening the middle class in America. It is the middle class that drives this country. It is the middle class on the back of the middle class that keeps America strong and great. And therefore, sir, that's how I would go about that, that process of including the union in my administration. Sir, thank you. Mr. Vignaraja. I'm the son, I'm the proud son of two union teachers here in Baltimore. Uh, it is a critical part of our, the texture of our city. But let's be honest, even when we support unions in uh, principle, even when we say it on the campaign trail, even when we get their endorsements, you know what we do if you're a city politician, you get into office, you turn your back on them. Because if you look at the folks that are doing the work in Baltimore City, too often it's folks that live in Pennsylvania 
for companies that are headquartered in New Jersey and New York. They're the ones that win the procurement deals. Do you know why? They win the procurement deals, sir, because they're the ones that made the donations. I have pledged that big donors to candidates should not be eligible for city contracts because the board of estimates upon which the mayor sits is the person who votes those contracts in. I'm the only campaign in Baltimore and Maryland history to run on public financing. We've raised over $750,000 in small donations, all from Baltimore City residents. That's how you get the money out of politics. Sir, thank you. Ms. Dixon. I was a part of a union when I was a teacher. My sister was a part of a union when she worked for Verizon and city government. I always collaborated and worked with unions. We have labor commissioners that are part of Baltimore City. The one thing that I did that was different from any other administration is I brought all the unions to the table and I met with them monthly so we could communicate and make sure we could address the issues that impact those respective unions. I've worked with unions outside of public office as well as inside of public office because I know the importance of making sure that people have a, a livable wage but also be able to take care of their families and deal with the issues that sometimes impact them. And so I have a track record of working with unions. Even though none of them supported me, it doesn't matter. I always look at the big picture. It's about bringing people in and working cohesively in order to address the issues that we're impacted by. Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, as a former uh, union member and the candidate on this stage who overwhelmingly is supported by unions in this election, I always stand with working class families and working union members. We have been able to make so much progress together by meeting with them consistently, by them being able to pick up the phone, by going and erasing years and decades of disinvestment into their salaries like we did for ASME and the folks who are working in water wastewater. It's the reason why ASME, the teachers union, our firefighters, our trade workers, our plumbers, all of these unions support Mayor Brandon Scott for re-election. Uh, our SEIU, our health care workers, all of them because I have been alongside them each and every day, fighting for them to get wages, pushing back on folks who want to take their union jobs away. They know I stand with them, and we stand together to move Baltimore forward for working families. Mr. Mayor, thank you. Head back to you, C4. Attorney Vignaraja, begin with you, and then candidates, please respond. When Freddie Gray tragically died, and that was a turning point in many ways for this city, and the riots that followed, people from around the country came and discovered that many areas like Sandtown, Winchester, where Freddie Gray was from, had no grocery store, had no option for healthy food. If you are elected mayor, and those of you on the stage, what would you do to use leverage that you have? They used to call them food deserts. Now I understand they're healthy food priority areas. Everything needs a name change. But anyway, uh, what would you do to attract healthy food to places like Sandtown, Winchester across the city? Look, I'm going to be the king of the concrete here, and with respect, C4, I'm still going to call it a food desert. Uh, the reality is that there are too many places in Baltimore that struggle with an inability to access healthy, fresh food. There are two things that we're going to do on day one. Number one, uh, one proposal to make grocery stores profitable, and this is where you need a little bit of background in business, is to understand that grocery stores have razor-thin margins. But one of the ways that we can increase the profitability of those grocery stores in food deserts is allow them, as many other states have done, in food deserts specifically, to sell wine and beer. That ability to sell those products will dramatically increase their profitability. It's an exemption we would give in places where there are food deserts. That's something concrete so you can replace the liquor stores with grocery stores to make them profitable. The second thing that we would do is an idea that Lyft and Uber do in other jurisdictions, which is to give flat rate three or four dollar free Lyft and Uber rates to people in food deserts to get to grocery stores. Those are That's concrete your, things we can do on day one. That's your time. Thank you, sir. Ms. Dixon. While we work in certain communities that are food deserts, we need to do a, a collaboration and I'm going to create a housing authority that will create a uh, development authority that's going to not only look at the vacant properties, but how we can attract amenities in those communities. But the first thing that we have to do is we have to deal with public safety in those neighborhoods. No matter who I talk to, if it's businesses like 
shop right up in Howard County, which we were able to get there. They want to do more, but we're going to have to deal with the crime. The city is not responding to these businesses in order to look at new neighborhoods, but we're going to have a comprehensive plan where we're going to look at amenities, how do we deal with the vacant properties, all of this together. You can't just do development and not deal with the amenities that are needed. But we're also going to guarantee that those neighborhoods are going to be safe and that people within those communities are going to be working in those stores. But we've got to deal with safety, um, Clarence, in order to address this issue and why we're not having them in certain communities. Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, C4, what we will do is continue the great work that we're already doing. We've been able to go and attract grocery stores. Everyone now knows that one's going to open right in the heart of East Baltimore after losing one and not having one for quite some time. Right across the street here at Northwest Shopping Center, we opened last year a brand new Lidl. There's another one coming on Bel Air Road. We all know how fit narrow are uh, the profit margins are for supermarkets, but it's also about that investment. We'll continue to do incentives. We'll continue to do everything that we can from city government to have the financial things that are needed there. We'll continue to drive down violence into historic rates in, of drops in the city of Baltimore. But most importantly, we'll do the work of working alongside those business owners, as I had to do myself. I physically myself went out to Las Vegas to meet with those folks and convince them to move to Baltimore because that's what leaders do and telling them that they will hire people for in those neighborhoods because I worked at Giant on Town Road growing up and know what that opportunity provided for me. Mr. Mayor, thank you. Mr. Wallace. Every problem is an opportunity. Every problem is an opportunity to create entrepreneurship. I just came back from the West Coast talking to businesses to, to convince them to consider Baltimore, to relocate or to expand to Baltimore, including food markets. So one of the things we have to do is two things. One is, as, a, as Mayor Wallace, we have to minimize the risk of the business investors. So as my, my opponents have said, it is a very thin margin business. So what the mayor has to do is have a program that, that puts capital aside to, to minimize the sharing the risk of these companies coming into, into these food, food deserts. In my model, we have what's called neighborhood economic development centers, and they are in the various villages I'm going to create when I become mayor. These neighborhood economic development centers, the cornerstone of them are supermarkets. But what's important is this, the people in the community will be part owners of that market. So they can become entrepreneurs and equity participants as well. Thank you, sir. Jane, you have the next question. In a recent Goucher College poll, 73% of voters said a lack of affordable housing was a major concern. You'd get the same answer almost every community in this country in terms of the lack of affordable housing. As mayor, how will you lead to increase the supply of affordable housing? Ms. Dixon. So Jane, I have a housing plan, and part of what we need to do, because the housing department right now is very dysfunctional, is to take the land bank concept, which I created years ago, but because of politics, it didn't happen. Odette Ramos has just introduced it. I want to create a neighborhood redevelopment authority and we're going to leverage lenders and other institutions to help to support this effort so we can streamline the process in order to create neighborhoods and communities not just for housing affordable housing but also the amenities that that can go along with that where we can open up supermarkets and not close cvs and other um, drug stores that we've attracted in the years and over the last four years they've all closed that we can clean up those communities and that's the way we're going to do it. We're going to be able to clear away the land, because right now we have 20,000 lots, and we're going to provide incentives to individuals to be able to be homeowners <coughs> with balancing those efforts. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, and thank you for the question, Jane. Uh, we don't need a land bank in Baltimore City. We have a housing a department that has all those authorities. And in fact, uh, in our vacancy plan that we unveiled again last December, we talk about a development authority that is already on the books that we're going to use to do that investment from the city, from the state, from the private, to take this work that has vacancy at its lowest point in 20 years now and escalating up to, to scale. But when you look at my record, 
Uh, we heard earlier about Uplands. That project had sat there not moving until I came into office and funded it, and that's why that affordable housing project is moving. I grew up in Park Heights. I heard about the Park Heights master plan from the time I was in eighth grade until I was in City Hall. We didn't sing a single shovel in the ground until I invested. In fact, I've used $100 million uh, to go into affordable housing projects. We have a housing accelerator fund that we just gave out $30 million to folks who are creating these units. We will continue to expand that great work by expanding on the investments that we're already making and cutting the red tape. Mr. Wallace. I will use business in order to solve that problem, and here's how we're going to do it. So for every developer, every major project in the city that somebody wants to get approved, the part of the deal that we negotiate is you will build a certain amount of affordable housing as a part of that project. My cousin Wayne Curry was county executive for Prince George's County. Wayne, Wayne taught me this practice. When these, when these big dealers come in and want to do deals, the big deals, you have to negotiate in that from the very, very beginning. What's also important here is to understand this, is that vacant housing and vacant land in Baltimore City is one of our biggest assets that we have. We use that asset as a tool to attract businesses to our cities and to our neighborhoods. And then when they come to our neighborhoods, whether it's light manufacturing, whether it's, whether it's uh, urban agriculture, whatever it is, we build into the deal that part of what you have to do is to build a certain amount of affordable housing for our people. And they might even be the same people who work for you in that business endeavor. We use the power of business. Mr. Vignaraja. This is remarkable to me that people think that the vacant housing problem has gotten better in Baltimore. The way that politicians convince you of that is by misleading you about the statistics. It's true. We only have 13,000 vacant houses in Baltimore this past year. That's down from 14,000 vacant houses in 2015. But what city politicians don't tell you is that the number of vacant lots has gone up from 16,000 to 20,000. So the overall number of vacants has gone in the wrong direction. Here's what we're going to do. Number one, we're going to bring back the Dollar Homes program in a way that works. We're going to be a co-investor with the folks that are willing to build up those houses and to live in those houses. Two, we're going to, like Washington, D.C., increase property taxes on abandoned properties. If you're an out-of-state developer, either do something with the property or sell it to someone who will. And number three, we're going to do what St. Petersburg did, which is to use eminent domain to take places that are being held by out-of-state investors and turn them over to affordable housing organizations. That is the kind of strategy that will actually deliver improvements. Sir, thank you. Jeff Salkin has the next question. In uh, poll after poll, voters say that their top issue is public safety. So I want to come back to that for a minute. The judge who's overseeing the consent decree says the biggest problem facing the police force is a lack of officers. Will you commit to adding officers to the city police department. Mr. Mayor, you're first. Yeah, thank you, and thank you for the question. You know, I know uh, George Bedard very well, uh, who is, uh, we have cons consistent meetings with. Yes, and he knows this and hears this from me, and we all should be reminded that they have approved the plan that we have for hiring and recruiting in Baltimore City Police Department. This issue is not just a Baltimore City issue. Every police department in the country is struggling with recruitment. In fact, when I'm with my fellow mayors, as I am often, many of them have no academy classes. We're going to continue to do that. We've already boosted up incentives for our officers to stay here. We'll be introducing legislation in the city council uh, in a few weeks to help retain even more officers in the city of Baltimore. We know that we have to have the right number of our sworn officers out on the street. But we also did some great work of changing, taking officers who were doing administrative jobs, putting them back out on the street, and allowing civilians to do that work. We will continue to have that balance so that we can continue this historic reduction in violent crime in Baltimore City. Mr. Wallace. One thing we have to work on right away is increasing the morale of the officers. And one of the things that does that immediately is to know that their, their, their CEO, the mayor of the city, has their back as long as they are doing their job in the right, in, in the right way. No question we have a gap in the, in the number of officers. One of the biggest deterrents to crime is the presence of officers. So what are we going to do under Mayor Wallace? Number one, we're going to put in a program that will accelerate the entry of veterans into the BPD force. Secondly, we're going to negotiate financial incentives to bring back some of the retired officers for one or two years to allow me to build back up the force 
to where it needs to be. And then thirdly, we're going to make, we're going to make us public safety, we're going to make it attractive to our young people again. It used to be an honorable profession, and it still is, but its image has been tarnished. We, uh, we, we have to change that image, working with the universities and the schools and neighborhoods to get young people involved. Thank you, sir. Mr. Vignarajan. When you hear politicians say, when you hear politicians say that unemployment and crime has been reduced last year, what they're actually telling you is that Baltimore is no different than every city in America. The year that we're celebrating last year, we had the second worst murder rate in America and the worst mass shooting in Baltimore history. That's what politicians are saying is a good year in Baltimore. Shame on them. We have to do a lot more and it's going to require police officers. We have to know that over the past 20 years, our police force is a thousand officers short. Over the last four years, our net loss under the current mayor's watch has been a hundred officers each year. Sure, that's a national problem. Problem, but then don't take credit for the things that are happening nationally and then when things are going wrong saying oh that's a national problem we put out a plan to offer incentives to retired officers from ne nearby jurisdictions it was endorsed by six police commissioners that said it was the most concrete viable strategy to get officers back into Baltimore I'm a former prosecutor I'm the one who can lead on this issue more than anyone sir thank you I'll give the mayor 30 seconds to rebut Thank you. I think what my, my opponent is forgetting to tell everybody in Baltimore is that our reduction in homicides double the national average here in Baltimore City. And we have known many, many years in Baltimore City where crime was down in every single city in this country except Baltimore. So that we don't get to say now when we're doubling the national average, well, crime is down everywhere. We have to understand this issue inside and out. And the truth is, is that we're recruiting officers every single day. We are hiring officers every single day. But more importantly, we're getting more guns off the street and driving down homicides at a higher rate with less officers and we'll do that even better when we have more. Mr. Mayor, thank you. Ms. Dixon, I'll get you on crime. The truth is that the classes are getting smaller, smaller, and smaller. When I was mayor, we not only went and recruited in Puerto Rico, we followed Mayor O'Malley and brought officers from Puerto Rico, and we retained officers. The plan now is to deal with the morale issue, go back and get young officers that are retired, who were frustrated, who want to come back and help to train and bring them on contract. I want to create an apprenticeship program at the high school level to expose our young people, not only to fire police, but also fire and EMS, so that they can understand the, the benefit in being a, pu a public servant within city government. We're also going to do an aggressive recruitment across the country. If I have to go back to Puerto Rico, that's what we'll do, because we have Finally, the first major who is Latino and Hispanic, because we have a growing Hispanic and Latino population who feel left out. Right now, the police department, the morale is low, they are discouraged, and they need someone who's going to be able to manage, lead them, and have them be a part of the process as we move forward. Thank you, ma'am. Next question comes from C4. Mr. Wallace, we know many of the ills that our young people are going through, as a matter of the majority of them, are because of the fact that we have a failed public education system in this city. We lead the state, Baltimore City does, in terms of chronic students who are chronically absent from school, which means 10% of the school year they're not attending. We have children who are functionally illiterate in many ways. What will you do to lead the effort to have a more hands-on approach to our public education system that for years many public officials in the city have said we can't do much about that? Great question. First of all, as mayor, I'm going to lean into education. I'm going to be the education mayor. Why? Because it's education which allowed me to get out of Cherry Hill to become a, a successful businessman who has created businesses and jobs and wealth. Secondly, we've got to change the people. The current CEO, I'm going to ask her to resign, or maybe she won't sign up back in June when she's due to, to leave. I'm going to ask the board to resign so I can build a whole new class of people that's going to run this system and move it forward. Secondly, we're going to, we're going to ask to, that, that we, that, not ask, we're going to tell that we're going to put in student code of conducts. We have it now, but it's not enforced. We're also going to add parent code of conduct. Right? So their parents know how to carry themselves because the house and the parents are very, very critical. And then secondly, we're going to rethink how we use the schools to stretch the schools to open early, to stay open late, so our kids have a safe place to learn. Mr. Vigan Raja. One, one half of our 
boys, one half of our girls and two thirds of our boys fail in the kindergarten readiness assessment test. They start two miles behind when they enter our education system. That is one of the reasons, one of the many reasons why I have pledged to deliver universal pre-K for every three and four year old with door to door transit. We need to make sure we're actually getting the kids to the school. We know that Cristo Rey does it. We know that other schools can do it for a very similar budget. And we know that the biggest barrier to getting a good education is not just what happens in the classroom, it's getting the kids to the classroom. The second thing we're going to change is stopping giving funding to schools based on how many kids come to school up through October 12th. That's not an imaginary date. That's the actual date. You know when truism skyrockets? October 13th. That is a perverse incentive that we give to principals and teachers. That is not the way we make sure that we take care of everyone. We have to make sure we get these kids to the school and we have to create the incentives for the principals and teachers to keep them there. Sir, thank you. Ms. Dixon. We are the third in the nation per pupil and have the poorest schools. The mayor has seven of the nine board members. The mayor is, should be actively involved with the schools. I'm going to create more community schools. We have a lot of challenges that our young people and families face. And if we look at the schools and identify the needs of that schools and bring those resources in the school, extend the school day, that needs to happen. Mental health services, every other type of program, partnerships. We also need to work on not passing children if they have not mastered math and reading. That in itself is why we have the truancy rate that we have in Baltimore City going on right now. We have to work with families, provide them with the support that they need. Education is the key to getting out of poverty. Education is the key to so many things in this world. Every child should graduate with a plan of action. That's not happening today. We have all the money and resources to be successful in this city, but we have not done our job because of management and accountability. Thank you, That's your time, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for the question. Uh, the reality is, is that we finally have the resources that Baltimore City Public Schools need. They were underfunded to the tune of $300 million for decades. I am the mayor that has put the most money into public schools because it's the right thing to do. I often imagine how many more of my friends will be alive if those before me would have invested into our education. Since I've been mayor, we've opened 12 new school buildings. And we heard a lot about our pre-K readiness. The truth is, is that our young people are outpacing the state when they come into uh, a school being ready. We can see the, the things that they're making to regain after the pandemic is outpacing the state in many cases. We have a long way to go. There is no doubt about that. We're going to continue our work of expanding community schools that we're already doing. We're going to continue the work of making sure that we have plans of action for our young people. We're going to continue to make the investments so that they have everything that they need, including the investments that we're making outside of the school building into their communities and programs that all those families Thank depend you. on. Thank you, sir. Jane. This is a question about the Complete Streets program. Many communities in the city, and elsewhere I might add, but particularly in this city, are very eager and impatient for efforts to mitigate speed, red light running, et cetera. Do you, first of all, support the current initiative by the Baltimore Police Department on traffic enforcement? Would you expand that? And would you expand the Complete Streets program, which does include reducing vehicle lanes on some streets and adding bike lanes? Mr. Vignaraja. Complete Streets is a philosophy about making our streets safe for everyone, pedestrians, bicyclists, and everyone else who wants to use our public thoroughfares. The reality is that in 2017, we made a plan to deliver 77 additional miles of bike lanes in Baltimore. You know how, we've, how many we've gotten? 12. It is unacceptable that we keep making these pledges and then we promises and then we under deliver them and then we celebrate 12 miles of bike lanes as progress. We can do better. We know we need to build consensus in communities. We know we need to get input, but we also need to actually execute on plans. I'm the only candidate that has pledged to dramatically expand free bus lanes across the city with five years to become the first, not the first city, the seventh city in America to have free buses citywide. We're going to start in the first 60 days with two Two new circulator routes, one on Edmondson Avenue all the way to Pulaski Highway, and the other one on Park Heights to North Avenue uh, to, to Harford Road. Those are the kinds of things that leaders can deliver on day one. We just haven't done it these past few years. Ms. Dixon. Complete streets, having safe streets, bikers, walkers, people who are in cars, transportation, 
The circulator was one that I created, and I want to expand that because a lot of our seniors are not able to even get to the bus stop because of the new system that the, system, that the state has created under the Hogan administration. I want to connect with our universities who have free buses to see if we can partner with them. I want to make sure that when we do the safe street, the, 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 the complete streets, that we communicate with the community and that we look at areas where individuals are not necessarily riding bikes. First of all, we need to smooth out our roads before we begin to put the bike lanes in. As a biker, I don't ride my bike on the streets. I just don't. But what we need to do is communicate with the community to be a part of that process. We need to also have pity the people from city government, particularly transportation and other agencies, to come back to work. You can't do anything if you're not at work. And we need people back to work so they can work with the citizens to make sure that the money that we're receiving, that we're using that money and it's not going to go back. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Mayor. Jane, thank you for the question. Yes, I support a VPD's initiative because that's done at my direction. No Baltimorean would disagree that following a pandemic, people have been driving like maniacs, running people over, running into cars, running into people's houses, and will continue to enforce the laws that are on the books. I support complete streets. This is not just about the red herring of bike lanes. This is about pedestrians that we've seen a significant reduction of pedestrian deaths and accidents here in Baltimore City under my leadership. This is about those folks who are on the bus. It was me that took the circulator and said no longer was it going to just go to Locust Point, it was going to go to Cherry Hill, despite knowing that that might cause the state to take highway user revenue from me. By the way, it was I that led the effort to get that funding restored alongside our partners uh, in, in the, the legislature to make sure that we are no longer being shorted the $900 million we've had for road infrastructure in Baltimore City. We're going to continue to do complete streets the right way, working with every community to make sure we're building street, streets for everyone not just cars in Baltimore. You, sir, Mr. Wallace. For every problem, there's an opportunity. I support complete streets. I, comport, I, I, uh, I support the BPD initiatives in that space. But as I said to you, I'm going to lean into education. I'm going to also lean into the red line because, because that is going to be a major economic engine for our, for our region because it is through light rail, which in this case, rear line will cost about $3.5 billion, but, but it will attract about $6.9 billion of development and investment in East Baltimore and West Baltimore. And so, yes, the Complete Street uh, idea makes sense. I support it. But along with that, how can we turn that into an economic engine to create the jobs in our neighborhoods that will, that will address the issue of the irrelevant class in our city? At this time, we're going to give each candidate a closing statement. They get one minute. We begin with candidate Dixon. Thank you for this opportunity. Baltimore is my home. I love the city. I love the people. I've dedicated my life to this city. I truly believe that we have all the ingredients to be successful in this city. I'm running to put an end to the issues that have defined this city for generations. We can live in a city that's safe, I know because I brought crime down to its lowest in 20 years. We can live in a city that's clean because we had the city clean. And even though my opponent is talking about all the things that he has done, the question is, why does this city look the way it does? Why is the crime out of control? Why are our schools in the condition that they're in? If in four years, this, uh, my opponent has done all these things. We need someone who's a, an adult in the room. We need someone who has the management skills and leadership skills that can really move this city forward and bring people to the table. People are crying to be part of the process and the plan. To, and that is why I'm running for mayor. Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Baltimore, four years ago, you sent me to City Hall uh, to reduce violence in Baltimore City. I did that to the tune that no other mayor has in history, 20%. 31% this year. You told me to invest in our neighborhoods and our young people. We've been opening brand new rec centers and renovating rec centers and opening ones that my opponent closed. We aren't balancing our budgets on the back of our firefighters and this public safety that we need. We've opened more new schools than any mayor in history, more investment into our schools than any mayor in history. The lowest level of unemployment Baltimore has ever seen. We have the eighth fastest growing economy in these United States of America. We led through a pandemic, and we did that all without scandal, without corruption, and doing in partnership with our residents and communities the right way. 
that has to matter in Baltimore. That certainly matters to those young people who are looking for someone to look up to and know what they can grow to be. We are just getting started, Baltimore. Let's finish the job over the next four years. Mr. Wallace? How long? How long will you allow politicians to take you for granted? How long will you allow them to take your vote for granted? How long will you allow them to ignore you? We have a chance now to break this fever, break this fever of failed leadership and failed policy. I want to take you to May 15th, the day after the election day. And you come down, have your coffee, turn, it, turn on the TV to get your news, to get the results of the election. And you got three possibilities. One is that the city of Baltimore has chosen to reelect its previous mayor who was convicted of embezzlement and who had to resign. That's one option. The second option is you, 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 you put in your current mayor who ignored you for three years and now he has your attention. Or you say you pivot and you break the fever and you elect this bald-headed, bow-legged kid from Cherry Hill who used education to get out of poverty, to build businesses, and to help the city to grow and move in a new direction. That's what we need in Baltimore Mr. City. Mr. Time. Thank you, sir. Mr. Vignaraja. Ask, ask, ask any DPW worker in Baltimore why the city is dirtier than it's ever been, and they will tell you that it started when Mayor Dixon got rid of twice-a-week trash pickup, and it ended because DPW is in complete dysfunction and disarray because of a lack of leadership. The reality is that if you listen to the city politicians, you think things are going great. You think that we're making major investments and improvements. The overdose death rate has skyrocketed. The number of vacants, houses and lots has skyrocketed. Auto thefts and every other major category of crime has skyrocketed. The only things that are getting better in Baltimore are the things that are getting better nationwide. The reality is it's the roosters taking credit for the dawn. The reality is that we need change, that things are not getting better. And if you think things are going well, then ask the city politicians why over the past 25 years, we've lost 25% of our population. Ask them why, if things are going so well, everyone in Baltimore, particularly in black Baltimore, is leaving. We need change, and we need it now, through Vignaraja for mayor. Thank you, sir. And our studio audience has been itching to applaud, so here's your moment now. I want to thank all of our candidates for joining us today. For those outside, right in. For those joining us outside and on air, remember early voting begins on May the 2nd. It will run through May the 9th. Primary voting is on the 14th. A big thank you to Morgan State University and the Murphy Fine Arts Center for hosting us. Have a wonderful evening.